three guesses where to open. No, no guesses. Just open up to 1 John. And uh, I hope this is blessing you as much as it's blessing me. Uh, I can literally, I told Bronk yesterday, I can literally feel the change happening on the inside of me. And uh, I'm looking forward to what's coming after that. You remember how J Dave would say us, it, say us, <laughs> Dave would tell us, he says, it's not the number of hours that you spend in prayer, the number of hours really that you meditate the word, or even the number of hours fasting. I was always glad to hear that part. He said, God doesn't fellowship with the number of hours. But what he does fellowship with is the change that those hours produces. I am looking forward to the fellowship that's coming after this change. It's life-changing for me. I'm getting some reports. It's life-changing to some others. I'm telling you, these messages are going to rescue some folks from hell. And I believe quite a few. Okay, so 1 John, and again, I'm not even going to try and review. I believe this is lesson number seven. Angie will take that off if it's not. <laughs> I believe it is. Eventually, we'll have these grouped together, probably just a series called 1 John. 1 John teachings or something like that. And I always like to start, now tonight we get to start on a new chapter. Glory to God, chapter 3. But let's start in John 1, 1 again. Because it is... This is the key to, this is what unlocked the book for me, was what he said right here. So John 1.1, 1, 1, he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now stop for a moment. Why is he going to such detail? He says, I am here as a witness. I'm not giving you anything secondhand. I was there. I touched him. I saw him. My hands have handled him. I mean, John, for crying out loud, is the one that was leaning on his chest at the Last Supper. Glory to God. Verse 2, for the life, the life, was manifested. We have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That word manifested is going to be important if we get that far tonight. Now that which we have seen and heard. Now here's, here's the reason for the letter. That which we have seen and heard. Not second hand. Eyewitness. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. I'm not adding one word to what he said. I'm not taking away one word from what he said. I'm not giving you something second hand passed down that I may have misunderstood. I heard him myself. I saw him myself. I walked with him. I worked with him. And what I saw and what I heard, now I'm declaring that to you. Why? That you may have fellowship with us. I got to stay with where. Okay. Pray for me. The teacher in me, there's so many rabbit trails here. <laughs> the purpose of him writing this and sharing the truth and eyewitness is so you can have fellowship with him and those with him. And by that process, you'll continue to have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, in the last few lessons, we talked about the Antichrist because he talked about it. And I can't go into much detail. We'll mention it a little bit in the course of teaching. See, those were the ones... When it says antichrist, what it means is they could no longer walk in fellowship with John. Because John says, listen, if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to be a follower, you have to do what Jesus says. You have to obey his commands. And you have to love not the world. Well, that was the last straw. They're going, like a lot of Christians today, well, I love Jesus, but I'm going to live in fornication if I want to. You're not obeying him. Well, I... Most Christians today, in America anyway, they think you can love the world and have Jesus too. And love, you know, love him. Serve the kingdom of God and serve the world. And Jesus plainly said, you can't do both. You're going to love one, hate the other. Love the other, hate the first one. You cannot serve God and mammon. Can't do it. Amen. So they had to separate themselves. And that's why he's saying, I'm writing this so that you can continue to have fellowship with us. 
So tonight, man, <laughs> tonight, chapter 3, glory to God, we're just going to jump in there. Chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father hath been. Oh, t the title of tonight's message, I know this one. Now we are the sons of God. Amen. Now we are the sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Verse 2. Beloved, here it is, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And notice what he starts off though. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Again, John is faithfully repeating what he heard Jesus say more than 50 years ago. Probably the most familiar verse in the Bible, John 3.16. For God so loved. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. You are in the family of God because of the love of God. Don't ever forget that. He loved you while you were still a sinner. Unable to save yourself. Unable to offer him anything to even negotiate with. Remember how Dave would teach us? There was that spiritual void of death between God and man. Dave taught us again and again, love reached across that void and gave you the blood of his son, Jesus. Now you had something you can hold up and approach him just to be able to say, hi. <laughs> How many remember? <laughs> but forgiveness by the blood of Jesus was not enough. See, his mercy forgave you by the blood of Jesus. But by his grace, he adopted you into his family. Rebirthed you with his own spiritual DNA. Sunday I'm going to do a series called Spiritual DNA. DNA. Divine Nature Attributes. <laughs> he adopted you into his family. Rebirthed you with his own spiritual DNA. And made you a son of God. John talked about that in the gospel that he wrote many, many years before. The events that he saw as a young man. And you can look it up later. John chapter 1 verse 12 and 13 says. But as many as received him. To them gave he power. To become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. Now notice which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God loved you. God chose to come after you. God sent his son while we were all sinners with no guarantee a single person would ever repent and trust. It was God's idea to save you. Don't you ever forget that. And you're in the kingdom by his love and by his grace. My feet are already wanting to go. Now here's an aspect of the Greek that I didn't know until this study. But notice there in 1 John, it says that we should be called the sons of God. You see that? In verse uh, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. There's an aspect there that you won't get unless you're a Greek scholar, which I'm not, but I'm smart enough to read their books. <laughs> what that means there, Greek scholars agree that the precise wording in the or original language means called to be sons of God. Now, who called us to be? God did. This is the creative work of God at work 
God always calls those things which be not as though they were. You see it? You were not when he called you. <laughs> you were a sinner. <laughs> you got that? But when he, when he called something, what was not becomes what is. God's cre this is his creation method from the beginning. We see it from Genesis 1. He calls those things which be not as though they were. For example, when there was no light. Now, in our King James Bible, it says nicely, let there be light. That's not what he said. In the Hebrew, it says, light be and light was. There was a time when he said, David, son of mine, be. Sue, daughter of mine, be. He called you. He called you. God said, light be and light was. Think about Abraham. God called Abraham a father of many nations. And that is exactly what Abraham became. When God called Abraham by a new name, Abraham, the father of a multitude, could you tell at first there was any change? Not at all. Did God call Abraham to be the father of a multitude only after he got to heaven? I call you the father of a multitude, but you'll never have that till you get to heaven. When God called Abraham a father of many nations, he intended Abraham to be the father of many nations now. In this, earth, in this life. And that's why John says, now we are, God called you, and now you are a son of God. Glory to God. John is saying, it's the same with you. God has called you a child of God. And even though it does not yet appear completely what you shall be, the creative process has begun. You are as surely a child of God now as Abraham was a father of many nations the day God said it. Glory to God. We could, we could apply that to healing. You could apply that to provision. You could apply that to every promise of God. We are not going to be sons of God when we get to heaven. Now we are the sons of God. In fact, we are so very much already the sons of God. John says the world doesn't know us any more than it knew Jesus. Why is that? Because darkness does not comprehend light. Remember what John wrote over 50 years earlier. John, this is chapter, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John's going, same with you. You're a child of light, just like he was the light. The world doesn't understand you any more than it understands him. John, again, is simply teaching what he heard Jesus teach over 50 years ago. See, every Christian knows John 3.16. I mean, I, I've never found one that didn't know that verse. <laughs> But hardly anybody knows what comes after it. So let's read all of it. Let's read it a little while. So starting again at John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. Now he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, th said all that to get to verse 19. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. See, but men love darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil, and they didn't want to give them up either. For everyone that doeth evil hateth, boy, if you underline, hateth the light. They call us haters now because we call evil evil. We call sin sin. What God calls sin, we call it sin, and they call us haters. No. 
No, we're a light in the darkness. They're the darkness. And they don't comprehend us, and they never will till they get born again. But our job is to love them, pray for them, but hold up the light. Okay. Everyone that doeth evil hates the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now, all through this epistle, we're going to do a little review. All through this epistle so far, John has been teaching these same truths over and over and over again. He's still doing it. The very first one, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Number two, we are children of light, and there's really no darkness in you, not in your spirit. We are to walk as children of the light. Now he's adding, but some love darkness rather than the light. They say they are children of the light, but they continue walking in darkness. They say they are children of the light, but they continue to do evil deeds, iniquity. They say they are children of light, but in truth they hate the light. And that's why those guys could no longer walk with John. The light was exposing what they were doing, and they're going, we're not going to give that up, but we believe grace covers it anyhow, and we'll be okay. And John is totally exposing that false doctrine. Number eight, those who know the truth, John says, they come to the light, and they become children of the light, and they forsake the deeds of darkness. And then they walk in the light as he is in the light. Those who walk in the light have fellowship with him who is light. But John says those who say they have fellowship with him, but continue to walk in habitual darkness, they're liars, and the truth is not in them. The world hates the light. Remember what, in a previous lesson, we, Jesus says, don't be surprised that the world hates you. It hated me first. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> A child of God, oh, if you write, listen to this now, write it now, write it later. I'm telling you, Holy Ghost gave me this one. A child of God is as incompatible with the world as light is incompatible with darkness. Oh, my Lord. I want to say it again. A child of God is as incompatible with the world as light is is incompatible with darkness. Light and dark cannot share the same room at the same time. You are either a child of darkness or you are a child of light. Stop trying to cohabitate, <laughs> said it better, with darkness. In street talk, I like street talk. I don't like theological talk. I like talk I can understand. Stop trying to get in bed with the world. Stop it. The world is not your friend. It doesn't understand you. The truth of it is it hates you. If you shine bright enough, they'll put you on a cross too. They'll try to anyway. Now the Apostle James says Christians who do that, who try to make friends with the world and shack up with the world, can I use that? He's, he calls them adulterers and adulteresses. And it, he calls it that way, not that they were each one committing sexual sin like that. They might have been, but that's not what he meant. What he meant was you are married to Christ. You are, you are the bride of Christ. You have a husband. You are married. And who are you? You can't get in bed with the world. That's adultery. It's for, it's it, It's a... Well, it's worse than fornication because you're married. <laughs> it's adultery. J James goes so far, you can look it up later. James 4, 4, he says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And I'm going to say it again. Now, when he says world here, he's not talking about the earth. 
It's not wrong to love sunsets and sunrises and, just, and the snow and the, and the birds and the ocean and all of those things. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But he is talking about the world systems. Remember in a previous lesson, in fact, John himself, near the end of this letter, he says the whole world, the world systems, not the earth, the whole world lieth in the power of the wicked one. In fact, remember last lesson, the wicked one offered the kingdoms of the world to Jesus. That was one of the temptations. And Jesus didn't say you don't have them, because he did have them. The whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. You cannot love the world. can't be light and dark at the same time well that was too much these guys that they had to break fellowship right there I can't have the world and Jesus too well I say I can John and they started going around preaching that you can and they're still preaching it today you know see so I gave you James witness let me just give you a couple see the Apostle Paul he also taught what Jesus taught none of these men went out and taught something different now Paul went his revelation went farther than about anybody's I think but it's all founded on the foundation that Jesus established. But here's just a couple from Paul. Same witness about darkness and light. Uh, Paul says, you can just write these down, Colossians 1.13. See, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Can you see you can't be in both? He delivered us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. You can't be in both at the same time. Jesus said it this way, Fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And he's talking about the kingdom of God. Paul wrote in Ephesians 5.11, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. John, uh, Jesus said, in, recorded in John 8, 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You getting it? Now we are called the sons of God. How do you know? I don't walk in darkness anymore. I'm a child of the light. I walk as a child of light. I don't try and cohabitate with the world. The world and I, we're not, we're not buds. <laughs> we're not friends. We're not in bed together either. Hmm. Hallelujah. We're going to make it to another verse. Glory to God. All right, now we're going to do verses 2 and 3 together. You really have to, even though we talked about 2 already. 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, that's Jesus, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him, if you underline, purifieth himself. What? I'm waiting on Jesus to do it. I'm waiting on the Holy Ghost to do it. I'm waiting on the tongues to slap it all out of me purifieth himself even as he is pure see now we are the sons of God you are no longer a child of the world you are a child of God the combined work of the new nature you received when you were born again and the Holy Spirit that has come to dwell within you the combined work there is the process of transforming you into the very same image as Christ. Jesus wants us to worship him. Now get this. But not as something unattainable. See, you're never going to be God. But he came to show us what a God man is supposed to look like. Say it another way. He came, now we are the sons of God. Well, how would, how would I function? Look at Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. He wants us to worship him, but not as something unattainable, just the opposite. Jesus came to start a new species of man. Jesus is the prototype. Hebrews 12, 2 says, we are to look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. 
Romans 8, 29 says, Jesus is the first born, not first raised, first born of many brethren. Hello, some of the many brethren. You can't join Christianity. You've got to be born into it. It is a new birth. You're not a son of Adam anymore. You're a son of Jesus. Jesus is your Adam. Hmm. He is the firstborn of many brethren. And it also says in Romans chapter 8 that we were predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Do you remember that? What does that mean? God made a decision before, before the foundation of the world. He knew this was going to happen. He made a decision that he will never repent of. He, he says, everyone that believes in my son, I make a decision. They will be conformed to the image of my son. Hallelujah. Well, we're all in that process right now. See, that new man on the inside of you is... Now, th go ahead and look at this one. I know you know it by heart, but go to Ephesians 4.24. But keep your marker in First John, of course. We're coming back. Now, see, that's not as easy with your iPhone, is it? Anyway. <laughs> well, it kind of is on mine. My, I have a little arrow. I can go right back to the verse. But anyway. Ephesians 4.24 says, And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Where it says after God, that means the new man is created after God in the same image of righteousness and true holiness. One Greek scholar said it this way, man by regeneration is restored to the image of God which he lost in the Garden of Eden. And that guy got it right. What did God say? Three times. He, God's not one to repeat himself very often. But back in Genesis 1, three times in two verses. In the image of God created he man. Created he man in the image of God. He says it three, three times in two verses to make sure we get it. His original plan for man was to be made in the image of God. Adam lost it at the fall. When you got born again in your spirit, you got that image back. You were recreated in the image of God. It's Genesis chapter 1 for you. <laughs> That's your beginning. Oh, okay. Hallelujah. Regeneration is done in the spirit instantly. We know that. Instantly your spirit is reborn. But have you noticed it's not instantly in the mind <laughs> or in the body? Have you noticed that? So the goal, what Paul is writing there, the goal is to allow that new man that's already created on the inside of us to take over to the point it comes to the outside where we're not like him in spirit only but also in how we think how we live how we walk as the offspring of God how we walk as children of light in a world of darkness it's good stuff now notice he said it does not yet appear what we shall be you ever read Revelations chapter 1? You ever seen how Jesus looks now? Quite different than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And even when he appeared to them after the resurrection, sometimes he would appear so different they didn't recognize who he was. You remember that? So Jesus appears quite different today than he appeared in the four Gospels. He is wearing a glorified body. His disciples sometimes didn't even recognize who he was when they saw him. See, when, but now when, he, now when he shall appear, when we, when we shall see him at the end of this thing, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. John is remembering how Jesus is called the Word and how he is called the Seed. Every seed has an image within it. Corn seed has the image of corn. Green peas have the image of green peas. You don't plant green peas and get corn. Isn't that right? Jesus is the express image of God. He is the seed. And when that seed is planted in you, 
that life of the seed is planted within you at the new birth, that life, that image begins to grow. And it's on a mission to take over your whole garden. Could I say that? It's on a mission, see. Your whole being, spirit, soul, and body. Jesus taught us how this process happens. You don't have to turn there. You're, like I say, it's too many verses. John's, John is just saying what Jesus taught. And here's another one. Mark 4, verse 26 through 28. Jesus said, So is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day. And the seed should spring and grow up. He, he knoweth not how. How many of you are glad you don't need to know how? Say, I don't need to know how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Smith Wigglesworth, they used to ask him. I mean, the man had amazing, astounding miracles. He'd pray and cancers would, in the view of everybody in the stadium, the cancer would fall off on the floor. You know? This one guy, he said, go buy, he had no legs, said, go buy a pair of shoes. Went and bought the pair of shoes. Put the stump or whatever it was. Maybe he had no foot. I don't remember. Anyway, he started to put the stump, whatever it was, in the shoe. I got to read that story again. It's called Ever Increasing Faith, if you want to read about it. It's a little book called Ever Increasing Faith. Not the one by Hagen. This is the one by, anyway, you'll find it. By Wiggle. Anyway, he obeyed. He went and bought the shoe, put the stump in the shoe, and the foot appeared on the end of the stump. And if I had a chance, I'd ask him too, what is the secret of faith? He'd always answer with this verse. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. That, you know what that tells me? He spent a lot of time with Jesus. He spent a lot of time praying in the Holy Ghost. Allowed that seed to come forward. It took some time. It didn't happen overnight. Bless God, if one man can get there, every man can get there. Because God is no respecter of persons. So Jesus said, now, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. So Jesus said that even in good ground, not everybody would allow the image within the seed to come to full harvest. If you back up just a little bit in that chapter, Mark 4, 20, these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit. Some 30 fold, some 60, and some 100 fold. Not even on good ground, not everybody allows the seed to come all the way. That's obvious, okay. So it's easy, it's easy to observe various levels of maturity in Christians. But the point Jesus was making was this. Not every Christian will come to full maturity in this life. But every Christian will have some maturity in this life. Maybe 30, maybe 60. But see what John is teaching, what Jesus taught. But he's also giving us this great hope of the future. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. See, maybe you only made it to a 30-fold in this life, maybe 60-fold. But in that day when you truly see him as he is, there will be a complete transformation to the image of the Son. We're already like him to various degrees, some 30, some 60, some 5. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Talking about Gary. But then we shall all be changed. Not only spirit, not only in soul, but even our bodies will be changed into a glorified body like he has. I'm looking forward to that. Now here's some supporting scriptures just to go along with his teaching. Romans 8, you don't have to turn there. Romans 8, 22 and 23. Paul saying, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Sue, are we looking forward to that? Although I'm pretty happy with her body now. But anyway, Philippians chapter 3. I told you, it's some, some 5, some 10. Okay. <laughs> Philippians 3. Hey, we're only 71. Come on. Hey. Philippians 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. 
for from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And I'm really glad he's able to do that. Well, one more, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 49 through 53. These are just witnesses that we're all going to be changed. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, well, you got that right. <laughs> we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Just a minute. Stay here, feet. We shall all be changed. <laughs> Glory to God. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Glory to God. Mm. Now we're at verse 3. 1 John 3, 3. Back to 1 John. Every man that hath this hope. How many have that hope? I got that hope. See, every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. See, the hope of future perfection, 100% maturity, does not relieve us of the responsibility of purifying ourselves now. Have you ever heard of mortification? Okay. See, perfection will come when we will see him as he is on that day. But look at what Jesus taught us about the transformation process. And I just quote this again. First the blade. You plant the seed. You sleep and you rise. In other words, there's time goes by. It is a process, not overnight. First the blade. Then the ear. Then the full corn in the ear. It is a process. See, Jesus is the word. He is the seed. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the light. You got all that? He has been sown into you at your new birth. He began speaking by the new nature from within you. The very day you are born again. I'll just use me instead of you. In my case, he began taking over my garden immediately. Immediately with things like, quote, this pornography has to go. I remember arguing with it. What? This foul language has to go. These dirty jokes have to go. You have to forgive those that hurt you. Not what? <laughs> he started immediately. The seed is trying to take over the garden. The life within me is trying to take over the soul of Gary. And I argued with it some, but I did yield. Mostly. Paul described this process a little differently, but it is speaking of precisely the same thing. Oh, now, our familiar friend, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now I wrote this. Please. I'm going to look into the camera this time. Listen. If I can give you a nugget of wisdom. If you'll learn anything from this 71 year old preacher. I can save you decades. Listen to me. This took me a lot of years to learn. I should take up a love offering from you right now. <laughs> Learn this, all caps, a renewed mind is not a mind that is full of knowledge. A renewed mind is one that yields to the voice of the new nature. Amen. If you can get that, you'll save yourself decades. There will be scholars of the Bible burn in hell forever because Jesus never became their Lord. That is the truth. A mind can be full of knowledge by hearing or reading, inputting the Word of God. 
But a renewed mind that transforms your life is a mind that does the Word of God. Knowledge, all caps again, knowledge will not transform you. But obedience to the new nature, the voice of the Holy Spirit, and the teachings of Jesus, that will transform your life. You don't present your body a living sacrifice by hearing the Word of God. You present your body a living sacrifice by doing the will of doing the Word of God. I'm going to say that again. You don't present your body a living sacrifice by hearing the Word of God. You present your body a living sacrifice by doing the Word of God. See, Jesus made it very clear. Oh, he taught this so many times. I didn't realize how many times till I started getting into this. First John. Over and over, Jesus made it clear that those who only hear his words and do not do his words have never really made him Lord. They can call him Lord. They may go to church. They may sing in the choir. But they, he is only their Lord if they do what he says. Now, here it is. I know you know it, but Luke 6. See, John is just teaching again and again. He said, what I have heard, what I have seen, I am declaring that unto you. Well, he heard and he saw this from Luke 6, 46 through 49. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, Jesus says, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, well, I'll show you to whom he's like. He's like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood came, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and it could not shake it because it was founded upon a rock. What is the rock? Hearing his sayings? What is the rock? Doing his sayings. Then he gives you the contrast, verse 49. But he that heareth and doeth not, and you can hear a lot. You can have a, I'm telling you, you can have a scholarly mind full of the Word of God. But if you never become a doer, he's like a man without a foundation, built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. James said it this way, another apostle, another witness. James chapter 1 verse 22 says, But be you doers of the word, and not hearers only. Now notice, deceiving your own selves. You know, in the context of our lesson, the last one and the one before that, where I was talk, John was talking about the Antichrist that had separated their fellowship and had gone out teaching different doctrine. They couldn't walk with John anymore because they didn't agree with the teachings of Jesus. G John calls them antichrist teachers. James, you know what James is saying here? If you're not going to be a doer of the word, you don't need anybody like that to deceive you. You're already deceiving yourself. Did you get that? You're already deceiving yourself if you hear the word only and don't do it. You can say you have fellowship with Christ all you want to, but you're just deceiving yourself. If, you, if you're continuing not to do his commandments, John says you don't know him, you don't love him, and you have no fellowship with him. Hmm. Okay, getting back to that verse that says everyone that has this hope in them, they purify themselves. I wrote this. How, do, how would Dave do that, the little nasalated flesh creature? Now, Brother Gary, I could be more nasalated than that. Now, Brother Gary, <laughs> is that better? Now, Brother Gary, purifying yourself sounds like works. And I would respond, no, that sounds like grace. You remember the man in Romans 7 who had received God's law but had no capacity to keep it? He represents every person since the fall of Adam, Jew or not, who loved God 
and wanted to live righteously. With his mind, he agreed that righteousness was good, that the law was good. He set out to keep it, but him, like everybody else who tried, he found he could not. Because every man born of woman has the law of sin and death working in their members. And no matter how hard they tried, trying to live holy by your own strength, that is works. That is works. But when you get born again by the grace of God, you receive a new nature. You literally become a new person on the inside, recreated, reborn in the image of God. Truly, it is Christ in you that empowers you now to live clean and holy. It's not you. You couldn't have done it before. There's none righteous without Christ. No, not one. I don't care how hard they tried all the way back to the fall of Adam. Not one, our Bible says. But you can live righteous now. But boy, don't you take credit for it. It's Christ in you that empowers you to do this. But that's the gospel. It's not you, but Christ in you that lives righteously through you. You have become a child of light. And your mind, as your mind yields to Christ within you, you simply walk a righteous life. You can't take credit for it. All the glory goes to Jesus and the Father who gave you Christ in the first place. Christ is your righteousness. You begin to say like Paul said in Galatians 2, 19 and 20. For I, through the law, am dead to the law. See, the law killed us all. God didn't come to help as a sinner. God didn't come to fix you. He come to kill you. Kill Paul too. <laughs> he said so. I threw, the, I threw the law. I'm dead to the law. That I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I but Christ liveth in me. And get this. He liveth in you. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. James talks about being a doer of the work. Right after he talks about being a doer of the word, the doer of the work, this man is blessed in his deed. See, the only real work is you yielding to Christ in you. And that is a renewed mind. That is a mind that submits itself to the Lordship of Jesus. Remember what Paul said? So was Saul at the time, Saul of Tarsus. I mean, this guy, he had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. He was persecuting Christians because he thought it was heresy. But boy, when he met the real Jesus, he instantly, whoever you are, <laughs> Lord, who are you? I don't know who you are, but whoever you are, you're Lord. And then he, the best thing, immediately, what would you have me do? Oh, that's the Christian walk right there. That's the whole life. What would you have me do? And he'll tell you from the inside out. Now, the first level of that is morality, righteousness. I'm, gonna get, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get to that in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself. The only work to this is yielding. That's your choice every time. That's your will every time. He'll never take it away from you. He'll never make that choice for you. The only work be a doer of the work. Well, the work is to yield to Christ in you. When he condemns a thing, condemns a thought, you condemn it. When he said that thought is okay, then you say it's okay. And that's how you walk righteously. It is you yielding your lordship to Christ's lordship. See, my flesh, trust me, will still do anything I let it do. It has no moral conscience at all. My flesh would still get drunk if I let it. <laughs> Where was we? Somewhere the other day, and he started playing Long Train Running by the Doobie Brothers. And I, to this day, I could taste bourbon and Coke in my mouth. <laughs> I've been drunk to that song so often, it's like, ring the bell. <laughs> Pavlov's dog, ring the bell, you know. I heard that song, long, and immediately I thought of a bourbon and Coke, and I almost could, like, taste it in my mouth. And that's my flesh. If I'd let it, are you kidding? Hmm. 
It'll do anything I let it do. It would still get drunk if I let it. But if the thought occurs to me, my renewed mind now says, I'm a child of light. I don't get drunk. Flesh, shut up. We'll put a little Sue in there. You're not the boss of me. I like that, see? Now, she says that to her flesh. I mean, I'm not the boss of her either, though. I want only Jesus to be the boss of Sue. Okay. <laughs> I tell it, no, you're not permitted to get drunk. See, that's a renewed mind, right? That's a yielded mind. That's being spiritually minded instead of carnally minded. This is how you purify yourself. By yielding to the righteousness of Christ that has been given to you as a free gift. Righteousness is yours for the living. But you do have to yield to it. You have to want it. And be willing to say no to the flesh. Because the flesh will often resist you with all of its strength. Withdrawals are not fun. You know, you can have withdrawals from anything. Television. It, everyone's familiar with drugs. You know, drug, drug type withdrawals and alcohol and nicotine. You can have gossip withdrawals. <laughs> the guys are going, eh. You can have football withdrawals. I'll get, it, I'll get one in a minute. I'll get one in a minute. What's he like? <laughs> you can have wife withdrawals. He'll separate you too long from your wife, you know. <laughs> withdrawals are not fun. And the flesh uses that very thing trying to get you to go back to what it wants. Yeah. See, who are you following? Are you following Christ or are you following the flesh? If you're led by Christ's nature within you, you will mortify the deeds of the body. And we're not going to make it. Okay, so I'm going to do this again. Sunday night, I did a lesson called... Is the flesh your shepherd? And I remember at uh, the youth conference, this sentence came out of my mouth, and I knew it was the Holy Ghost. So sometimes you've got to go listen to your own stuff so you can see what he's teaching you. <laughs> but I said, it, I said, I was teaching along this line, and I said, Now, who are you following? Is the Lord your shepherd? And the sentence came out of my mouth. Is the flesh your shepherd? Boy, that just stuck with me, and I kept thinking about that. I kept thinking about the 23rd Psalm. Everyone's familiar with the 23rd Psalm. And I'm going to read the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death... I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Isn't this great? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Boy, don't we like that? See, that's for you if the Lord is your shepherd. But what if you live your life with the flesh being your shepherd? What I mean by that, you're just going to do what the flesh says. You're not going to, even as a Christian, you, you hear the Lord on the inside, but you say, I'm choosing the flesh anyway. And you do it habitually. You develop a lifestyle. And that becomes your life for 30 years. Well, this would be your song. And it's called, The Flesh is My Shepherd. The flesh is my shepherd, I shall always want. My flesh maketh me to lie down with the prostitute and live in fornication with my girlfriend. It leads me into all the tumultuous waters of sin. The flesh destroys my soul by leading me in the paths of unrighteousness for Satan's namesake. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm in constant fear of evil. For I have forsaken the Lord. I have rebelled against the Lord's rod and staff. And I have forsaken my own salvation. I sit and dine at the table of the Lord's enemies. And I eat whatever my flesh serves me to eat. The flesh keeps me from the Lord's anointing. My cup is bone dry. 
Surely the pleasures of sin in this life are my true love. And I will dwell in hell forever. This is serious business. Those men that separated their fellowship from John. The next part of this lesson talks exactly about what's coming for them. And anybody who chooses that path. I don't think we're going to make it tonight. Hang on. Nope. So let's stay with this. He that has that hope in himself. Now we are the sons of God. We have this hope in us. The seed has been planted. It's in a process of maturing right now. What he's after us to do is we can speed that up a little bit. And how you do that is where you know you've been saying no to the Lord. It's time to start saying yes to the Lord. I know this teaching is narrowing my own path. Things that, and they're not, they're not terrible, horrible things, but man, some of the, even some of the TV that you thought was okay a few years ago, you go, can't watch. I'll share this. I'm going to quit. I promise. Pastor Bronx said, he told me the other day, he says, you know, Smith Wigglesworth would not even let a newspaper in his house. We wonder where the power is, right? Now, can you imagine? It's a British newspaper. I mean, I would imagine it's pretty stuck up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Proper, probably. You know, it's not like, you know, like the, some of the stuff you see at the checkout lines. <laughs> okay. And he says, that's, that's lies. And I don't allow lies in my house. You have to leave that outside. Bronx said the other day, oh, my God. If he wouldn't let in a British newspaper, if, if Smith walked in our houses and saw what we let in our house, Smith might wonder if any of us were saved. But you are. You really are. What he's calling us to do is rise up as the sons of God that we truly are. Begin understanding we are light. Walk as children of light in the midst of the darkness and the more dark it gets the brighter our light shines rise up against the flesh anything that's been compromising say no you're not the boss of me anymore the flesh is not my shepherd the Lord is my shepherd and him and him alone do I serve did you get anything out of that Whew. it's hard for me not to go into the next lesson but we still got chapters to go so it's okay are you getting anything out of this glory to God